Well, it's my pleasure to be here this evening talking about two of my favorite subjects, Chartres Cathedral and the Labyrinth. And uh, what I've done here is to combine several different presentations to try to give you a very quick overview on a little bit of Labyrinth history and bringing it right up to the present moment, but also to talk some about the Chartres Cathedral because Chartres is quite a unique place and the labyrinth in Chartres is probably the most elegant labyrinth divine design that has been made. And so since you have here in Dolores that exact pattern in the same exact size as in the cathedral, I thought that you would like to know a little bit about the cathedral itself and why it's so unique and how it stands out. So this is usually about a four hour lecture <laughs> no, but I'll try to make it maybe about an hour or a little more, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. If you look up the word labyrinth in the, on the internet, this is what you'll get, which is the movie Labyrinth with David Bowie and Jim Henson and uh, um, Jennifer Connelly or whatever her name is had to make her way through all that to get the baby back. Well, anyway, I won't go into the story. But this is, uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion. Americans call mazes labyrinths and the British call labyrinths mazes and no one seems to agree. But in modern parlance in the labyrinth community, we distinguish the two such that a labyrinth is a design that has no choices, no intersections. It has a single path that leads to the center and then you exit on the same path. It is uh, considered to be a form of pilgrimage in that you're making an outer journey for an inner purpose. It's a spiritual practice. And the word, the part of that that I like is the practice part. I believe that walking labyrinths is, has a cumulative effect. And the more you walk them, the more effect they have. Uh, I actually think that the labyrinth meets each person wherever they are and helps them take the next step along their spiritual journey. The labyrinth is inward directed because it's inward that we go to find truth, not out in the world in smoke and mirrors. It's a collaborative effort, people walking the labyrinth together. It's about the journey, not about reaching the goal, because we know with a single path that you will reach the goal. So it's not trying to get to the center, but it's about the quality of your journey. It doesn't take any mental effort so your mind can relax, but you still have to stay alert. So that state of alertness with a relaxed mind is ideal for meditation and for prayer. And that is probably what the labyrinth is most used for because it's so well suited for those. The labyrinth calms you when you walk in it and there are no shortcuts in a labyrinth. You have to walk the entire route to get to your goal. And finally, in a labyrinth, you find yourself. There is a poem in the beginning of a book by Hermann Kern that says, in the labyrinth, you don't encounter the minotaur. In the labyrinth, you find yourself. In the labyrinth, you don't lose yourself. In the labyrinth, you find yourself. But a maze has lots of intersections. You get uh, and dead ends and so forth. It is a form of amusement. It is a contest. One or the other party is amused, either the person walking it or the person who designed it. But that depends on how well it comes out for walking it. It is outward directed because you constantly are in your intellect trying to think if you've been here before and what you're doing. It's competitive. You're trying to solve this great mystery. Uh, it's about getting to the goal. It agitates the mind. It's aggravating. And it can be long or short. You might happen to luck your way into the center or you may never get there at all. And finally, in a maze, you lose yourself. So these are really the differences between a labyrinth and a maze. It's a lot more than just the number of paths. It is an entirely opposite ends of the spectrum as far as your experience is concerned. This is the oldest uh, pattern known for labyrinths. It's called the classical 
seven circuit labyrinth. It was made commonly in Scandinavia, all around the Baltic Sea, there are hundreds of these labyrinths. And generally speaking, if you put the stones on the ground like this, they stay there unless somebody moves them. So um, there are labyrinths like this that are hundreds of years old that, are, that exist in, uh, in Scandinavia. But to tell you, to show you how little we know about labyrinths, this is a labyrinth in Siberia, and the Russian government says that this is 10,000 years old. But the world's greatest labyrinth scholar, Jeff Soward, who lives in England, believes it's about 800 years old. So it's either 800 years old or maybe it's 10,000 years old. <laughs> and that's pretty much the state of labyrinth history, uh, trying to figure out what's going on with labyrinths. But probably the one myth that people are familiar with that involves labyrinths has to do with the, with the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur, in which Theseus makes his way in and slays the Minotaur and finds his way back out thanks to the thread that's given to him by Ariadne. This particular myth really caught the imagination of people throughout time. And so I think it's because the labyrinth touches into archetypes that the labyrinth touches people so deeply. And so one of the archetypes is death and afterlife. The, the oldest labyrinths seem to be located near tombs. They might have been um, a, a map for the deceased to find his way through the underworld. The test of the trial, the hero's journey, like Theseus going in and slaying the Minotaur, uh, initiation or passage, a journey through life cycles, good fortune, um, a fortress that surrounds you and protects you, or bad fortune, you're in a prison and you're entrapped, you can't get out. Uh, liter literary uses of the word labyrinth usually refer to difficulty and complexity. You look up labyrinth on, um, on Amazon.com and you'll find many books called The Labyrinth of Politics and The Labyrinth of This and The Labyrinth of That using it as an adjective for difficulty. Uh, resurrection and rebirth and fertility, these are probably the, the greatest identifications with the labyrinths in ancient times. And also there is the center and the feminine. And finally, the labyrinth as a spiritual path of meditation, of going within and being centered. Archetypes are what we share in our human experience over long periods of time. They're, they're like shared traits. And so, um, what was the Jungian term for it? The, the collective unconscious? Is that what it is? And so, uh, these are, these I believe touch people deeply when these themes are involved with the labyrinth because it's something that we all share at a deep level. The Romans had labyrinths uh, but they were just floor decorations. These paths would be one tile wide, maybe two or three inches wide. But they included in the center the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. The first Christian labyrinth was a Roman labyrinth with the center changed and there's a word puzzle that has the words for Sancta Ecclesia, Holy Church. This was in about the fourth century. But really, between then and, and medieval times, we really know very little. So even in a historic account like this, we jump to Lucca, Italy, where at the entrance to the cathedral, they put a labyrinth on the wall. Now, these days, we have finger labyrinths made out of wood and other materials. But this was the first finger labyrinth, I guess you would say, uh, probably built towards the end of the 12th century. And to the right, in Latin, was an inscription that says, this is the labyrinth that Daedalus built. No one can get out except with the help of Ariadne's thread. So here we still have Theseus and the Minotaur in a Christian setting, um, still talking about that particular archetype. Which takes us to Chartres Cathedral. Chartres Cathedral, my great love, I've been there 50 times over a period of 40 years. And I'm going back again this year, which will be my 51st visit. 
Chartres is very unique in many ways. It's located about an hour's drive outside of Paris in the middle of Iowa. Well, they call it Beauce, actually, but it's like Iowa. It's their grain growing area, which today is an out of the way place, but which in the Middle Ages was one of the main sources of, of wealth. It was either grain or wine because everyone ate bread and everyone drank wine. And so it was actually a very important and influential place in the Middle Ages. But let's start in the year 1000 when they had the Y1K problem. And that was, they thought that the change of the year from the year 999 to the year 1000 would be the apocalypse. It would be the end of, the, of, of time. Of course, that wasn't actually the turn of the first millennium, but they didn't get that any better than we did, that, that it's actually a year later than that. But um, they thought that they were going to be in hot water, I guess literally. And uh, so you would have to expect that one minute after midnight, there was a great sigh of relief <laughs> that, uh, that the world was continuing. And so Will and Ariel Durant call the ensuing 200 years the age of faith. And what happened was that a lot of different things combined, political stability, better weather, um, and, and it was a time of uh, increased population, growing wealth, that people had very great um, expectations for the future. That it was, their, their spirits were, were raised. And so, the action for the next 200 years was mostly in the monastic community. And just about anyone, regardless of their education, could go and join the monastery, become uh, literate, and do all kinds of leading edge interesting things. Such that when um, um, Bernard of Clairvaux would go into a village and speak, the wives would lock their husbands in the basement because sometimes when he left, 12 or 15 of the village men would go off with him to join the monasteries because they were so inspired by what he had to say. Uh, so this is just uh, um, at the end of the 12th century a list of the monasteries of just two of the different ones, the, the Cistercians and the uh, Benedictine ones in the, the great abbey in Cluny. So it just gives you some idea of how many monasteries there were. But there were many other orders, so the, the map would even be more covered than that. So they began to build churches, and they wanted, because of this rising spirit, they wanted to have them larger and taller and more light. But they had a problem, and the problem was stone. Uh, the, to build it taller, they had to make the walls thicker. They hesitated to pierce the walls and make the windows very big because the, they would fall down. So this church, San Cernan in Toulouse, is an example of about as high as you can go. And you can see the windows in the middle section right sort of under the tower, how small the little windows are. And so they didn't let very much light inside. The way they built them was to have a barrel vault in which the roof weight was distributed down the entire length of the wall. And that's why they couldn't open the wall up very much because the, uh, the wall was weight bearing. The churches at that time followed the Roman pattern. And to build it taller, you put a second story above the aisles. So you see here, there are aisles on either side. And above it, there's a second story called a gallery or a tribune. And that was what they did to stabilize the, the building in order to make it taller. But then they began to have three, diff three um, inventions within architecture which allowed the, a, a big change in the ability to build churches. One was the, the groin vault, which took the, the weight and distributed it to the corners such that in between there, you could have an open space, such as a window. The, the, another one is the pointed arch. And the third one is the flying buttress. Now, all of this was developed over a period of maybe 100 or 150 years, such that 
there were all of these little elements that people had been building in small churches, mostly in northern France in the Paris Basin. Um, and each time they built a church, that architect or that mason would come up with another little solution. And this was where they, were, what they were able to do by the end of the 12th century. This is the cathedral in Laon. And you can notice on the left there that there is that tribune, that second story that has like a big room all, of, all the way along, because they were following the Roman pattern of how you build a church. So what's unique about Chartres Cathedral is that the great master who built Chartres Cathedral had the same, had this great array of tools and maybe better than anyone up until then understood their possibilities, where you could take them and what you could do. So he proposed a church of a size and a complexity using a style that had never been done before. It was absolutely audacious, and it was built in a very short period of time for cathedrals, um, approximately 30 years or so, at the beginning of the 13th century, so in the early 1200s. Now, Chartres was a special place for a number of reasons. During the Age of Faith, there was kind of a... Um, a new hope that was raised for people. The Catholic Church had overplayed the sin and damnation card, and so most people had felt that they had very little chance of ever going to heaven or ever being saved until Mary became their intercessor. So once they believed that Mary could say a good word for them and help them get into heaven and help them um, with salvation, there, there was a great wave of devotion to Mary. Uh, Saint uh, Bernard of Clairvaux was one of her great champions and had some beautiful, beautiful prayers that he had. Prayers that would say things like, you know, if you are in need, she will provide. If you are ill, she will make you healthy. If you are in doubt, she will give you confidence. Um, really providing you all that you needed for your spiritual enrichment. The cathedral at Chartres was dedicated to the Virgin Mary as far back as the 5th century. So it was one of the leading, most identified places dedicated to Mary. Now, of course, there were some 150 cathedrals built within a very short period of time, and the vast majority of them were dedicated to Notre Dame, to Our Lady, who would, of course, be Mary. So Mary was really one of the great influences in the building of the great Gothic cathedrals. And it was to be Mary's home on earth and God's home on earth. And so they wanted them to be tall and, and incredibly awesome and inspiring to go in there with the beautiful windows and so forth. In Chartres Cathedral, they had a relic, which is a veil that was worn by the Virgin Mary. And so pilgrims came from far afield to, to see this uh, veil and helped even more as part of the Marian revival in the, in the 12th century. Now, for the curious, they did a carbon dating on the veil, and it appears to come from the first century from Syria. So that's not far off, actually, um, as to what the possibility might be for that piece of cloth. There are also in Chartres two black Madonnas. And so they really, the, the, the presence of Mary in Chartres Cathedral extends even into pre-Christian symbolism, which was adopted within the Christian church through the black Madonnas. Now, this was what happened in Chartres Cathedral. And if you just walk in, you would say, OK, it's a big church. But if you look, there is no tribune. There is no second story above the aisles. There is, there is no gallery. So this was not built like a, like a Roman church. It was a completely new idea, a completely new design. And so it had never been done before. There's these large aisles, the little triforium, which is where the roof is over the aisle. And then look at the, the huge windows up at the top that fill it from pillar to pillar. Um, it was the widest church, the tallest church, had the biggest windows. It was just amazing, so amazing that it became the standard not only for all future churches, but previously built churches changed. For example, this is Notre Dame in Paris. 
Now you see on the left there is a tribune because it was built in the 12th century when they were still using the Roman pattern. But if you look all the way down um, those to, to the last segment of wall, just before the big pillar on the right, you can see the wall is kind of a blank wall and there's a little window up above it. The very last bay, it's a blank wall and up at top just a small window. Well, all of the bays were like that when it was first built. But after Chartres Cathedral was built, they rebuilt it and put in windows just like Chartres Cathedral all down the nave. And that was true with many churches. So Chartres became the standard just because of its great beauty, its flying buttresses, um, just what they accomplished there. So the way I like to see it is that all of these previous little inventions were like individual instruments. And in Chartres Cathedral, for the first time, the symphony played. And after that, you got variations on the theme. But you could have variations because the theme was now there. The theme was in place. And this was Mary's home on earth. Now, yes, all of the cathedrals were dedicated to the Virgin Mary, or many, but even in the Middle Ages they said, yes, but Chartres was her favorite place. And in Chartres Cathedral, there is, of course, a labyrinth. And that this is the labyrinth that you have here uh, in Dolores. And um, it's made out of limestone, the same limestone as the rest of the cathedral. It comes from a few miles away from Chartres. And also a kind of black marble for the lines. And this, we, we have no record at all as to what this was for. Uh, there is only one medieval reference to the use of a labyrinth. And it was at Easter time, a ceremony, actually a dance, between the canons and the dean. So the canons were the priests assigned to a cathedral, and the dean was the head of the chapter of all of the priests. So that was at Easter time, just as pre-Christian labyrinths are often also associated with Easter time, a time of resurrection, of rebirth, of, of the sun returning, of new hope and new light. So the labyrinth certainly represents all of those things. And here's a real nice picture where you can see the color of the stone, very warm and very inviting. Eight, the, the labyrinth itself was built in the year 1201. So it's 807 years old <laughs> today. There were labyrinths in other cathedrals, but they were removed. And one of them, Amiens, it was replaced and, and, and put back in, but it's not the original one. But in Chartres, this is the original labyrinth made by the great master who laid out the cathedral. And in the center, there used to be a plaque, but it's gone now. And the plaque portrayed Theseus and the Minotaur in the middle of the labyrinth. So in the Middle Ages, people didn't have any problem with, with that they saw all of history as being a precursor to the Christian era. So everything had a, had a meaning that pointed towards Christianity. And so some people would say, well, maybe Theseus was Christ and the Minotaur was sin and it was Christ overcoming sin, except Christ wouldn't need Ariadne's thread. So I believe that Theseus was each of us, each of us on our spiritual quest, on our spiritual journey, and we have to meet our and overcome our minotaurs. And we are able to achieve this through the thread, which is the teaching of the church, which was given by not Ariadne, but the Virgin Mary in the form of Christ. So uh, that's probably how they saw that in the Middle Ages. It made perfect sense for them to put that in the center of the labyrinth in, in Chartres Cathedral. You also have to remember that the cathedral is dedicated to the Virgin Mary as is a labyrinth. And so Ariadne offering the, the thread of salvation is certainly a theme that fits right in. Now, after Chartres, the, the, the cathedrals got bigger and bigger. This is the one in Reims, or in French, Reims. And um, this is the, the most ornate of all of the Gothic cathedrals. This is the direction in which Gothic went. But to me, it changed. It became just a very complicated, um, ornate architectural style. Whereas in Chartres, it was informed by this great devotion to Mary and this great intent so that, um, that 
some of what Chartres represents is lost when you get into the later cathedrals. And so looking up some of these pictures on the internet, I found a very unusual photograph which was taken in World War I when most, several of the Gothic cathedrals were seriously damaged in the war. And someone took a picture of a German bomb hitting the cathedral in World War I. Very unusual picture. The cathedral was barely saved. It was so seriously damaged. But eventually they did raise the money and they restored the cathedral. But it was, it was seriously injured. And in Chartres, in World War II, they removed all the windows in two weeks, created them, created them up, put half of them in the crypt and the other half in caves in the Dordogne. And this is a picture of Charles de Gaulle coming out of Chartres Cathedral in World War II. You don't see any cathedral there because it's all covered with sandbags to protect the windows and the statuary from, from damage. And it turns out that the Germans respected Chartres Cathedral in World War II and they didn't do any damage to it. The greatest damage was the destruction of the medieval archives which a fortune uh, of, of manuscripts from the Middle Ages which was destroyed by American bombing. So here on the left is Chartres Cathedral and on the right is Amiens, the largest of the French cathedrals. And you know, Amiens is, is, is like a wedding cake. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous and it's elegant. But to me, Chartres is interior, it's calm, it's reserved. It just has a spirit to, to it. And maybe it's that I've been there so many more times than I've been to another place. But just to show you what happened to Gothic, let's go to the cathedral in Milan in Italy and see what happened. See how restful that is to your soul, you know? I mean, it just kind of makes you want to jump up and down or, or run around and, you know, I mean, I don't know. But so, you see, Chartres really represents this very small window in, in, in history when at the end of the 12th century there was great learning and devotion, and, but it was still all informed by a religious purpose where later um, the universities became secular and then the Renaissance art became secular and, and uh, the world went on in a different direction. But um, Chartres Cathedral was designed using principles known as sacred geometry. And sacred geometry has a great assumption and that is that the physical universe was created by a divine hand. So these are two paintings from the Middle Ages showing God creating the earth, creating um, using dividers or a compass and a globe. And this is the act of creation by a divine hand and a divine mind. And so I want to just say a, a few things about sacred geometry because it will help you understand the labyrinth, among other things. First of all, as I said, there is the assumption that a divine hand created the universe and that that creation was lawful according to number and proportion. And we can discover these laws by looking at nature. So when you buy a book on sacred geometry, they go right to nature very quickly. But people often don't actually answer the question in their books, what is so sacred about sacred geometry? And the answer is that all this lawfulness that we can find in nature, all of this... Um, um, number and proportion originated in the divine mind. It's sacred because God did it. And therefore, when, when we discover what those laws are and we use them, we can create the same way that God created. So that if you were to build a Gothic cathedral or in any culture, in, in any kind of temple, they use the geometry that they believe comes from creation and from a divine mind. And that way, you create like God, and God will know God's home on earth, and etc. So that, those are, that's the, the basis of sacred geometry. And as they studied it, they found that certain numbers resonated with certain qualities and certain values. So obviously the number one would represent all that is, the, the, the primordial everything. And it's a dot, or it could be a circle, if you enlarge that dot. And the number two, two dots, could be joined by a line. 
but it means much, much more than that. The step from one to two represents the greatest mystery in all of history that has been contemplated for thousands of years by theologians and, and, and philosophers, and that is, how did one become expressed in multiplicity? How did the great unity express itself um, in all the diversity that we see around us in the physical world? So the step from one to two was going into duality. To, to have a tree, you have to have that which is a tree and that which is not a tree. So you have to have duality to create a physical universe. So the step from one to two represents creation, represents that, that great mystery. And it can, be, it can be expressed geometrically, for example, by a rectangle, which is one on one side and two on the other side. It would be a geometric figure expressing the numbers one and two. So look, look at Chartres Cathedral for a moment. On the right, we see that the labyrinth, which is towards the top, and the altar, which is towards the bottom, are equidistant from the crossing in the center of the cathedral. So if the whole line is two, it's one from the center of the cathedral to the labyrinth or to the altar. Now, whoever the great architect was of Chartres Cathedral probably said, I don't care how dense they are in the 21st century, somebody's going to notice that the altar and the labyrinth are equidistant from the center of this church. And they represent the two ends of our pilgrimage, starting on the labyrinth, our, our walk through this earth, and ending up in the apse, the, the altar, which is our, our journey into eternity. But if you look on the left, the, the whole cathedral can be enclosed in a box, a double square, which is one uh, by two. And if you look in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies was a double square or a double cube because it was three-dimensional. So those were uses of sacred geometry. Now three, for the first time, gives us something because with three dots we can, fill the, we can have a triangle. But think of the two as if it were two circles. And those circles were separate from each other you wouldn't be able to get from one circle to the other. So if one circle represented, say, the physical world, and the other circle represented heaven or the spiritual world, and they didn't overlap, you wouldn't be able to get from one to the other. So when you overlap two circles by putting their centers on the perimeter of, the, of each other, you get this shape that is there in this aqua color called the vesica piscis, or the mandorla. The vesica piscis means the bladder of the fish. You can see the Christian fish symbol there. Or mandorla means almond shape in, in Latin. And that is the integration between the two circles. Now we can get from the physical world to the spiritual world because there is a bridge or a, a, a gateway or a way to get from one, or the, one to the other. So if you look now at the cathedrals, on the right is Ro Romanesque Cathedral in Autun in France, and on the left the Romanesque portion of Chartres Cathedral, which survived the fire and is still there. Um, Christ is shown in a mandorla because he is both circles. He is fully man and fully God. And the church saw itself as this bridge between the two worlds. Um, and so that symbolism was very prevalent and is based on a a, 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 um, a numerical value that comes from sacred geometry. Now John James, the great, the great student of Chartres Cathedral who's written many books about it and is the world's greatest authority on the construction of Gothic cathedrals, makes a very interesting statement and that is that Romanesque cathedrals had the Vesca but no, got no Gothic cathedrals included that symbolism in the cathedral. And he felt that instead they had a different symbol that represented the bridge between the two worlds. And that was the labyrinth. The labyrinth in the floors of the Gothic cathedrals took over that responsibility of showing our journey and the, the passage from this world to the next. Now, a Gothic cathedral shows that in all ways. It shows it horizontally as you walk through from the, from, um, 
this world towards, towards the next world, and also vertically uh, the, the vault represents heaven and so forth. So the symbolism was there, but the labyrinth represented now that bridge between the worlds. And finally, four, we put a dot in space, and we can have a three-dimensional object, that pyramid there. So it takes four dots to have a three-dimensional object with height, width, and breadth. And so the number four, not surprisingly, has come to stand for the physical world, the four corners of the earth, the four directions, the four elements. And so four is the number that represents the body, whereas going back to three, that's the number that represents the spirit or the soul, or in Christianity, it's easy with the Trinity as, as also as part, of the, um, as part of the tradition. So three and four represent our spirits and our bodies, or the invisible aspect to ourselves and the visible aspect. So what we would really like to do is be as fully of both of those as possible. We would like to combine three and four. And when you do that, you get seven if you add them, or 12 if you multiply them. And those are the most mystical of all numbers, 3, 4, 7, and 12, for many more reasons than what I've been able to tell you in just this brief little description. But um, I want to show you the labyrinth now. And look at, the, look at a number of aspects of the labyrinth. There are 11 paths which are enclosed by 12 circles, because there's a circle in the middle, in the, and the inside and a circle on the outside. So there's one more circle than there are paths. So there's 12 circles. Now look at the vertical axis, like at the top, for example, and you'll see there are four turns. But on the horizontal axis, there are three turns. So every quadrant has three and four. It has soul and body, spirit and mundane world. And then look at the entire labyrinth. It's a circle, which represents eternity or the divine, but the cruciform shape divides it into four, four quadrants, which, which relates then to this world. And so it, it goes on and on and on. There's many, many more symbols here. Um, those little circles around the outside are called lunations because there are 112 of them, which is four times 28. 28 being a lunar month, or the symbolic number for a lunar month. And also because in Chartres Cathedral, lunar refers to Mary, and the sun refers to Christ. And throughout the cathedral, there are solar and lunar symbolism. And so the labyrinth in a cathedral dedicated to Mary represents... Um, represents many things that relate to, to the feminine and to Mary's numbers. In the center, with the six circles, uh, there is a, a actually based on a geometry of seven. There is a circle in the center, which uh, is invisible because you don't, you don't see it with the way the petals are drawn. But the number seven has always related to the Virgin. And so in Chartres Cathedral, it is just one more um, symbolism that is there in relation to the appreciation of the Virgin Mary. Now if you're interested in reading about sacred geometry, these are the two of the best books that are, are out there. The one on the left is rather new and it's um, um, in full color and it's quite nice to read. And the one on the right is uh, has been around for a while and th there's a website called uh, constructingtheuniverse.com. It's just off the top of the screen here a little bit. constructingtheuniverse.com. And they have workbooks that you can get and, and learn to practice sacred geometry and to, to draw all of these shapes and so forth. So that's a, a great resource for anyone interested in pursuing that. So here we have Chartres Cathedral in all of its simplicity and yet great elegance. But I want to tell you about something that is virtually unknown. When I had the opportunity to take groups on pilgrimage to Chartres over a period of 17 years, I was able to gain access to areas of the cathedral that are closed to the public. And at the very top level of uh, pathway, on the outside of the cathedral, 
on the south end of the cathedral are a couple of little dormers and, and little wooden doors and you open the doors and you go inside and in three of them they're just little storerooms and the fourth one you go in and you say what? and this is what it is in, inside a, a place that is not open to the public in any way there is a boss with 12 skeletal ribs now skeletal ribs are the way we build buildings you build you know the girders and then you come back and put in the floors and the walls and so forth that hadn't been invented yet in the Middle Ages. This may be the first example of a skeletal rib, you know, that, that was ever built. And not only that, but some of the stones on the left side here off, uh, are, are extremely complex. The way they're carved and their shapes and the tenons that go in and this little window and all kinds of things. And it weighs more than a ton. A single complex stone that weighs more than a ton that was hoisted all the way to the top of Chartres Cathedral and put into this storeroom that no one would ever see. Now, what's going on here? <laughs> and what I think is going on here was that this was, the, the cathedral was, was built to the glory of God and the Virgin of Mary. The, the architect's names are unknown. The, the, the artists who created all the great windows and, and sculptures did not sign their work. It was about devotion. It wasn't about um, recognition. And I believe that this was one of the architects um, of Chartres Cathedral taking the element, moving the envelope further than it had ever been moved, doing something that had never been done, not because he wanted to get great credit, but just because he could do it. And he wanted to do it here um, and, and have it there for all time. So I gained great inspiration from this. And so when I build my labyrinths, I do not sign them. There's no indication when we, when we leave a labyrinth behind of who made it. Because uh, it's not about us, just as for the architect of, uh, of Chartres, it wasn't about them. But I have been to Chartres many times, you know, 50 times. This is me with an architect um, measuring the labyrinth. And then we went, he went back to um, New Harmony, Indiana and built this beautiful granite labyrinth so that I have had the pleasure for the last 13 years of making my living, my living as a labyrinth maker. And I just want to show you a little bit about what's going on in the modern day labyrinth world. Um, we make temporary labyrinths just out of masking tape on the floor. This is for a, a New Year's Eve celebration a 100-foot diameter labyrinth made on New Year's Eve afternoon, walked by 2,000 people that evening and pulled up the next day. So it only existed for less than 24 hours. This is our studio in St. Louis, 8,000 square feet, an artist's dream with clear story windows and light and space. And this is where we make our portable canvas labyrinths. As far as I know, canvas labyrinths are an American invention. I can find no, no writing and, and anything written about labyrinths um, of them carrying labyrinths with them. They, they, this is an American mobility thing. And so there are a number of possibilities now. You can take a labyrinth on a plane. You can take it in your car. You can, you can go places. Or a church can lay out a portable labyrinth and people can walk it and then they can put it away again and not have to dedicate that space only for the use of a labyrinth. So portable labyrinths are something that we make all year round and uh, uh, in this beautiful space in St. Louis. We just absolutely love it. Portable labyrinth you can see here. Here's a, one of our rainbow labyrinths with a rainbow group of people who have just walked it. Um, this is in Jersey City, New Jersey. And the city has a program for youth in danger. Um, and they, um, they use a labyrinth as part of their program. This is, I really love this picture. Hospitals have labyrinths. Labyrinths offer a, a form of inner healing, whereas technology offers a form of outer healing. So if I'm ever in an accident, take me to the, the, the best technological hospital and let them heal my wounds and patch my bones and fix my burns or whatever 
But if you then ask of science, what shall I do with my soul, you know, with my distress, with the experience of my illness, with how worried I am about my family or my career or whatever, science will say, I'm sorry, that's not our field. So hospitals were, were incomplete without a, an adequate spiritual tool that would allow patients and staff and visitors to deal with their experience, not just with their ailment. And so we are putting labyrinths ever more um, increasingly uh, in hospitals. This particular hospital is the Marion Joy Rehabilitation Hospital in Wheaton, Illinois. And they built a new hospital and, and a new parking garage, and they connected it with the old hospital at, a, at an underground level. And so it wouldn't be a dark, awful you know, space. They opened it up with this atrium with glass all the way around and then put a, a labyrinth in the middle. So we love to show this to architects because it, 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 it pulled together their entire campus, not as an afterthought, but as a, a serious architectural um, element. So we've uh, made labyrinths, and uh, this is one happens to be in Honolulu, Hawaii. We developed a technique of using concrete to make the color. So the lines you see there are not paint or stain. They're actually polymer concrete. And by coloring with concrete, we were able to make a very durable, lang uh, very durable labyrinth. And now, in this year, 2008, we have offered for the first time another product, and that is granite, so that we can make the lines with a granite material as opposed to a concrete material, which is even more um, durable and also available in wonderful colors that don't work very well for concrete, especially blues. So the labyrinth we're making here at the Sophia Retreat Center in, in Dolores is our second labyrinth made out of the granite material, and it's just going to sparkle in the sun because the, of the crystal that's in the granite and it's just it's going to be a beautiful labyrinth. We're at the time that I'm giving this talk we're in the middle of building it right now. So we have technologies where we actually cut the pattern of the labyrinth right into the concrete and uh, that's a lot more uh, technically uh, challenging um, but we make labyrinths in, in a lot of different ways using a lot of tools that we had to invent we couldn't go down to Sears and buy lab craftsman labyrinth making tools. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have such a thing. So we, uh, we've had to design our own tools. And then the end result has been some very nice, very durable labyrinths that will be here for generations. But I want to just step back for a minute in time and tell you what happened to Chartres Cathedral. And uh, this picture, this was a, a lithograph that was done in about the year 1690-1695. It's the only a picture that we have of that date that shows people in Chartres Cathedral actually walking the labyrinth. But a hundred years later at the end of the 18th century, uh, at the time of the French Revolution and so forth, the churches became property of the state and the state sold them to people and in many cases they dynamited the church to sell the stone. They turned them into quarries, such that as this, this abbey in Jumiege in, uh, in Normandy. But if you remember way back to the beginning where I showed the, uh, all the monasteries that emanated from the, the great monastery in Cluny, which was the largest church in Christendom, uh, it was dynamited and, and, uh, and destroyed at the time of the French Revolution. And they had thought to do the same thing for Chartres Cathedral. It just barely escaped because one citizen complained that it would make such a big mess in the center of town that it would be bad for business, and they decided not to do it. So they rededicated it, uh, not as a church, but as a temple of learning until 1822 when it was used again as a church. So Chartres barely survived the the time that was so deadly for many of the great churches and abbeys. And this is a quote from uh, 1212, which talks about the fact that um, all the previous churches had burned because they were constructed largely of wood. But now Chartres with its stone vaults uh, would be protected, which is its tortoise shell, would be protected and wouldn't have to 
fear from fire until judgment day. But it still did have the roof made out of wooden timbers. And so in 1836, as it turns out, there was a fire that destroyed the roof of Chartres Cathedral. But the rest of the cathedral survived. The windows were not damaged. The, the church was not damaged. But it, without a roof on it, you could then see the tops of all the vaults. So this is what it looks like from the top when you're, instead of when you're down in the cathedral looking up uh, above you, seeing the other side of the vaults. And then they built a new roof, which was itself an astounding accomplishment made out of cast iron. And it was, it was completed in the 1830s and was the largest cast iron structure until they built the Eiffel Tower 60 years later. And this is the roof the inside the attic, if you will, of Chartres Cathedral with its cast iron roof. And the outside of it was copper, which has turned green from oxidation. So Chartres has a green roof, its famous green roof. But this is what it looks like inside. And it's really quite amazing. And then all these are the tops of the vaults here between these walkways. And uh, we were able to take our group up there and, and see some of that, which is, which is pretty neat. So that's really what I wanted to tell you about, the, the sacred geometry, the labyrinth, why Chartres Cathedral is so exquisite and so, so special in my own mind. But I want to end with one more slide. There is a tendency in the United States and in Western culture of people wanting to walk labyrinths by themselves. It's a very American thing to say. I don't want to walk with a group. I want to walk by myself. I want to do my own thing. I don't want people to get in the way. They might make some noise. They might bother me, you know. But the fact is that when you walk the labyrinth with a group of people, that it is a far more powerful experience because of the logos that is built up by the group intention, the group energy, and so forth, that's created by this collaborative effect of walking labyrinths together. Well, there was a man in the labyrinth world uh, about 10 years ago who took a picture at a labyrinth walk. And what you see here is white, was not visible to the naked eye. He just took a regular 35 millimeter picture with a camera. And when it was developed, this energy pattern showed up on the film. If you look through that person on the right, it's very obvious. Each person in the room has energy uh, surrounding them and then flowing up and joining with all the energy of everyone else in the room. So if you ever had to, wanted to see some kind of indication of the metaphysical truth that we are all one and we are all joined together, for whatever reason, this photograph seems to have turned out in a way that shows that that is true. So that's how, what I want to end with is the, the, the thought that we are all one and that we're all walking in the same labyrinth. So we have time if you want uh, to ask any questions. Can you talk a little about the symbolism in the sharp um, one of um, the Mary and Jesus symbolism you started to tell me about with the lunations? Right. Well, um, Mary and Jesus symbolism is very interesting in all of Chartres Cathedral. First of all, <clears throat> when Chartres was built, poverty was still heretical. When Chartres was built, the church was very rich, and those who went around preaching poverty um, were, were, were discouraged. Um, it's interesting that just a few years after the labyrinth was built in Chartres was when St. Francis of Assisi had his conversion experience, and barely escaped being considered heretical himself, but brought in at the beginning of the 13th century then, you know, there were a number of new orders which, which preached poverty and simplicity. But when Chartres was built, every, uh, every indication, every symbol of Jesus and Mary, they were always royalty. They're always on thrones and they're always wearing crowns and um, and that was that was how they were seen at this this time by the church but and it, what is unusual is that Mary's stature in this is is far greater than in any other cathedral anywhere her throne is like 
two inches lower than, than Christ's throne, you know. And she is, um, in many instances, um, sitting on her throne, holding Jesus in her lap and so forth. So the, uh, the appreciation of the Virgin Mary throughout, on the front of the cathedral is the Virgin Mary with the, uh, the seven liberal arts, which was indicating that the Virgin Mary sort of associating her with the, uh, the work of Boethius, which was the uh, consolation of philosophy, which was the, the learning, the, the basis of all learning in the Middle Ages. And they saw Mary as the inspiration uh, for all learning and, uh, um, and, and many other instances. So when you get to the, to the labyrinth, the lunations are out on the outside representing a lunar calendar now that really has a double meaning, not just the, the lunar being Mary, but also the lunar calendar is used to calculate the date for Easter, which is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the, sp the spring equinox. So you had to figure that out using a lunar calendar. And then, of course, Easter being a time of resurrection and rebirth. So that's all tied together in the numbers and the symbolism of the labyrinth and in the, the, the statuary and the windows. The, the windows themselves, um, uh, any number of them show Mary. Um, uh, I, I forget the exact number, but the f former rector of Chartres Cathedral used to give a tour of the Marian windows in Chartres, and it was really inspirational to, to see all the, the different possibilities that were, that were portrayed there. Um, about half of the windows are, um, are saints or people who led exemplary Christian lives, and the other half are uh, the disciples in Christ and Mary and so forth. But it, uh, it's quite a, a sermon in stone and glass to... Uh, to see what's represented there in the cathedral. What's your personal passion for it? Did you have an experience going there the first time and deciding you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? What was my uh, personal um, experience that led me to labyrinths? Um, <clears throat> initially, it came from my interest in Gothic cathedrals. I really love the 12th century time in history and what it represents, that whole age of faith where all knowledge had was was informed by a devotional purpose. And I, I really think that, um, <clears throat> that the cathedrals represented the highest point of human intellect informed by, you know, a, a religious belief. Um, so I had visited the cathedrals over and over, and I, was, I had seen labyrinths in the floor of cathedrals, but I had never really pursued them. Because uh, you know, I saw the stained glass, and I didn't go out and learn how to um, how to make stained glass or something. It really didn't happen until Lauren Artris, who is a, a a priest at the Episcopal Cathedral in San Francisco, Grace Cathedral, began to use the Chartres labyrinth. She had a canvas labyrinth made, probably the first canvas labyrinth, and she began traveling and teaching forms of prayer and meditation using the labyrinth. And that caught my attention. And so I made contact with her, and she said that everywhere she went, people were saying, where can I get a canvas labyrinth just like yours? And, and she didn't have anyone who could make them. The one who had made that one, it was so complex that they never wanted to see a labyrinth again. <laughs> so they weren't willing to make them. And I had studied the geometry, I understood the labyrinth, I understood the cathedral. And I said, I can make you a labyrinth. So I made a canvas labyrinth and I sent it to her and that was in October of 1995. And then I began making labyrinths and selling them wholesale to Grace Cathedral and they sold them to churches around the country and other people. And then finally I went retail and then I, I started doing other kinds of labyrinths and, and then started writing and then speaking and all of that, uh, which uh, 13 years later has really been a very pleasant life. Although, as you see, as we're sitting here, and my colleague Chuck is sitting next to me here, our, our eyelids are droopy because we've been out on the concrete for 10 hours for the last three days in a row, and uh, we're a little tired and sleepy. So we love the work, and it's also fairly demanding. But when we're all done, it's just like, you know, looking at a Chartres Cathedral or something and just being inspired by what we're able to do and, 
and thinking of all the people who will be able to walk it and benefit from it. And it really keeps us going for a price. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we, we, we do, of course, make a living at this. <laughs> well, I still have a little voice left. The voice started disappearing during the talk. but <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. And uh, I hope... I hope all of those listening to uh, this or watching this video, or if you are, will come here and see this one, and then we'll also um, have a labyrinth of your own to be able to appreciate all of its possibilities. My, my wish for you. Thank you.